This is Delhi. Please stand by for our next program. This is All India Radio. In our national program of talks tonight, we bring you a panel discussion entitled Step into a Stepwell. The participants are Professor Ravindra Vaswara, renowned architect, historian and conservationist, Professor Neelkant Chaya, former dean of the Faculty of Architecture Center for Environmental Planning and Technology, Ahmedabad, and Sri Sohan Neelkant, famous architect and Sarod player who initiates and moderates the discussion. Good evening. In Gujarati, there is a saying which goes like this. Adi kadi vav ne navghan kuvo, jene na joya te jeev tamuo. There is a step well called Adi kadi ni vav and there is a well called navghan kuvo. If you have not seen this, you have not lived enough, you have not seen enough things in life. And today, we are going to talk about these kind of water structures, especially the step well. And I'm very happy to introduce the participants for today's discussion, Mr. Ravindra Vasavada. Besides being a practicing architect and academic, he's a highly respected research scholar with several documented research projects to his credit. Some of the positions held by him are principal investigator, Indian National Science Academy, New Delhi, Senior Research Fellow, National Institute of Design, Ahmedabad, and Senior Fellow, German Research Council, Bonn. The conferment upon him of the fellowship by the Royal Asiatic Society of Britain and Northern Ireland speaks volumes for his work. He was the key person instrumental for getting Ahmedabad the status of World Heritage City. Mr. Vasavda, we are very glad to have you talk with us today. Uh, I want you. to introduce the second participant for today's discussion, who is Mr. Neil Kanchaya, also a practicing architect and an academic. He retired about 10 years ago as the Dean, Faculty of Architecture, SEPT University, Ahmedabad. Since 2015, he has been closely associated with Srishti, the renowned design institute at Bangalore, where he holds the UNESCO chair in culture, habitat, and sustainable development. He has coordinated the Gandhi Heritage Sites documentation project. Mr. Chaya, very glad to have you also here. Thank you. Professor Vasavda, how important water is to human beings? And I think if you could tell us more about the step wells of not only Gujarat, but step wells in general, as a background to further understanding of them. Sure. I mean, as the, the poem suggests, there is an intrinsic kind of connection between the life and its sustaining forces, you know, water being the most important one. Mm -hmm. Water is also given a kind of position of divinity. So all these connections, you know, end up with symbolism, you know, about water and the structures related to this. Mm -hmm. So it is something, you know, which has always attracted human imaginations to somehow articulate this kind of source of life. Mm -hmm. Wherever civilizations have developed, it is along the rivers or along the oceans or along water bodies, you know, which were man-made. And there are several types of water bodies, you know, which people build themselves, you know, in order to harvest or harness the sources of water mm -hmm. from nature. So step well is a kind of duality. It's a kind of monumental structure or it could be a very simple structure, but it is combining two things together. One is well and the other one are steps, you know, which is a kind of stepped corridor which leads you to the well. Now, these kind of structures came up where water was scarce. The earliest ones that we can see today in Western India are around Saurashtra coast, which dates back to something like 6th or 7th century. And it was still common until 100 years ago, 150 mm -hmm. years ago, because the last which was built was near Ahmedabad around the late 19th century, around 1860. Mm. So you have a history of about a millennium or more to sort of study these kind of structures. And 
I think the focus is about the step wells in Ahmedabad. So I think to start with, I would suggest that we talk in general about water structures in Western India and then maybe focus on five important water structures in and around Ahmedabad city. So this is something, you know, where I would somehow begin and uh, say that the tradition of these kind of step wells is seen in actually Western India, right from northwest to almost south, which means it extends all the way up to Karnataka, Maharashtra, Gujarat, Rajasthan, and in Delhi. You know, because these structures were really built over a period of time and during different phases of social evolution. And uh, its development in terms of architectural form could be traced from earliest times to the, you know, latest 19th century period, depending upon the kind of patronage it got. And also it was something, you know, which in a sense correlated with the concurrent architectural development Hmm. in this region. Wherever water was not available all the year around, these kind of structures were constructed. They actually sourced their water from aquifer, which was always rich, and uh, it provided for agriculture and for animal kingdom, for human beings, for everybody. You know, it is said that it is something like 87 crore, you know, living beings. Yes. So this is something, you know, which is quite fascinating, you know, in terms of a kind of typology which was developed here. Mm. Now, out of all these areas, you know, which I mentioned, Gujarat somehow had a very strong tradition of monumentality to these kind of structures. And the exuberance in terms of its treatment, you know, as a kind of structure which also acted as a kind of human institution, Mm. you know, not only for water, but for religion, for public utility and for general welfare, you know, that this was really providing. And that is why the patronage many times came from ruling families. And mostly these were constructed in honor of somebody. And mostly these are built by women, the patronage. Is it? That is why in Ahmedabad also, if you see, Adalaj is known as Rudabai, Dada Hari is Bai Hari, Bai Hari. Mm. Mata Bhavani, yes. you know, is also mm-hmm. the oldest one which is existing here. And Jethabai, you know, which is in Isanpur, mm. is the only exception here where it was a male patron. So this is something, you know, which is also a very interesting mm. aspect. I think there are so many important points you have mentioned. Let's go step by step. One is you said that its use or its purpose was not just to get water. Here, you actually went, walked down the steps, all the way down, and it became darker and cooler as you went down. And you said it was a social institution. Can you talk a little bit about how the the step well spaces were actually useful to society in terms of social institution? Two, three things, you know. First of all, these wells were in a sense ceremonial. Mm-hmm. When it came to this kind of ceremonial structures, it was connected with fairs and festivals and rituals because it was there that people realized that water is divinity. It is not just to drink or take bath or wash, Mm. but it was something beyond that. Mm. So these kind of corridors became steps and landings, and the landings became a kind of, you know, they used to call it angan, Mm. like a courtyard. Yes. And that is where the pause happened, you know, when people were going down or up after fetching water. The worship came into play. The other reason for establishing places of worship within the step well was also this, that people hesitated from misusing Mm -hmm. the water Mm -hmm. and the structure. Mm -hmm. Because many times, in almost all types, you see, for example, in Atalaj or Baiharir or even Queen step well, if you see, there was always a kind of kund at the end of the corridor Mm -hmm. before you encounter the well. So, well's first overflow was in the kund. Which is a kind of a tank. It's a kind of square tank with steps. Yes. Where people approach water without any kind of fear or hesitation. Mm. Because wells were very deep. So, people were never sort of allowed to go to well directly. There was a kind of transition point from where they can use the water. Now, stepped corridor was also in a sense devised 
depending on the depth of well. For example, if the depth of well is 100 feet, then there would be at least 30 feet of water continuously during the year. Mm. It can rise above, but it can be minimum at that level. Mm. And that is where on the cylinder wall of the well, they would put a relief of aquatic animals. I see. Depending on the water level. Mm -hmm. You know, each aquatic creature would prefer a certain depth of water. Like a to tortoise survive. or yeah. a snake yeah. or a frog. Yeah. Yeah. So they would be at different levels. Yes, they would be at different levels. Indicating level. where they... Where so the symbolism of this aquatic animal also would be marking their particular level of existence. You know. <laughs> so this is something, you know, which was very important. The depth of the water determined the length of the steps. Yes. Of the course. corridor. So first the well was dug and then the length of the corridor was decided depending on the steps. Mm. So that was the logic. So, so they first, have to have enough space. For yes, that. yes. Yes. Yeah. So that is where the site was very important. Yes. And where they did not have enough space, the stepped corridor became L shape or uh, round uh, as or, in Junagadh. Uh, Junagadh that is Kuo, that is yeah. Navgan Kuo. Yes. Our uh, Amrut Varshini is a L shape step well. Yes. In Ahmedabad. Yes. Now some people have said that well while working out the stepped corridor they made a mistake. <laughs> and that's why they turned to the well. Now that never happens. <laughs> it was a planned L-shaped well in order to reach water. Mm. Because there was a site limitation in terms of available land, mm. they had planned this length in L shape. Yes, yes. There are many such L-shaped wells. There are Chowmuk mm. Awau. Chowmuk means four. Four ways to enter. Yes. Mm. And the well is in center. So that way. There are also kund vows, mm. you know, so Chaumukhi is a kund vow. Yes. Okay. You know, so that is something, you know, which is also very interesting. And these are all actually defined and explained in the classical texts like Aparajita Prucha, Samarangan Sutradhar or Silpa Shastras. And these are all, in a sense, also codified in manner of its building. Yes. And depending on the site conditions and the depth of the well, you know, these well structures were devised. Mm. So the other thing you said was that the making of the step well was parallel with the architectural developments at that particular time. Can yes. you talk about that a little bit with relation to maybe the older ones in Junagadh and then others yeah. in Gujarat and so on? You know, the barest step well is Adikari. In Junagadh. In Junagadh. Now it is completely modified, unfortunately. But historically, that was the barest kind of a step well, which was in a way discovered while quarrying stones. Mm -hmm. You know, the stone quarry turned into a kind of well. Well. well with the articulation of the fort wall. Mm -hmm. So this is something, you know, which was the simplest of its kind and also quite deep. As against that, if supposing you compare Adalaj Vav or Bai Harir, mm. but I would say Adalaj because I think it is something at the end of 15th century and even Bai Harir, same time. Mm. But Adalaj is the most prolific kind of, you know, Vav around Ahmedabad. Mm. And that's why it is also very famous. Now, the period was almost end of Sultanat. Mm. At that time, still, the Gujarat traditions of architecture were very prolific. And I think the influences of Chalukyan and Solanki, mm. you know, was still everywhere in architecture. Mm. So the temple kind architecture, of columns, for example. Temple architecture. For example, the expression of you know, Ghattapallava, as it is known as. Mm. Because this, once again, was connected with water symbolism. Mm. You know, the pot, yes. you know, in, in the pillar. So, the entire construction of the pavilions, for example, which were intermittent. Yes. So, this is something, you know, which was absolutely done in the manner of a kind of temple building. Yes. And the expression of the elements... Mm. In terms of its exuberance, you know, in terms of its sculptural details, in terms of selection of motifs, in terms of proportions. Yes. Everywhere, you know, that kind of architectural practice was something which was followed. Now, in terms of decorations, you know, in terms of bands, you know, which were actually depicting the 
cross stones, you know, which went into the earth mm. to sort of contain the masonry on the sides. So it was the basic wall. Yes. And some stones went deeper True. into the earth. To, to, to somehow tie it. up to, to with the earth. It. Yes. Because there was a kind of, you know, notion that these were all retaining structures, you yes. see. Yes. But the soil in Gujarat was so good that actually once you stepped it up like that into some kind of a offsetted manner mm. you never required any kind of retention retention there was no thrust from there was the... no thrust mm. because and that is what they also in a sense judged in terms of building so uh, the, the engineering soil. is is very very high level absolutely high level of engineering and in terms of also the presence of aquifer there is a kind of text which also is a kind of derivative of the classical text called Bhugarb Jal Vignan, the science of underground water. There is a text, you know, which is available, which described scientifically the presence of aquifer when you walk on the plane. Yeah. Mm. It demanded an observation on the insect life, observations on the kind of shrubbery. It also demanded observations on the trees and the nature of their sway. Oh. So, with all these observations and by sensing the earth mm. at two feet depth. Okay. At two feet depth, they would sense the earth mm. and they would imagine the content of the soil, which was invariably moist. So, when they saw these things, they spotted a kind of place where if one digs, one will find water. One will find one water. Will find water. Mm. So, I think coming back to the uh, structuring or the mm. form, mm. you know, it was something, you know, which actually also required tremendous amount of knowledge of the soil. And then, you know, after putting these kind of plates, mm. they had a band, you know, which displayed a particular kind of carving. Know, carving yes. You know, which is normally known as Laharavallali. In yes. Sanskrit. It goes up and down like yes. a wave. Yeah. yeah, it's a kind of lahar. And floral creeper patterns, these were very common. The aquatic world was very common. Mm. Mm. That in places they would place this kind of birds, creature, you know, which were dependent on water. Mm. I see. Even on the wall decorations. Wow. And the niches, you know, which were like always a temple niche, you know, mm. with pediment and everything properly worked out. And the Kirti Mukhas, you know, which were very common mm. in the later style of Gujarat, you know, which was Maru Gurjar. Mm. And, uh, you know, the first one was Maha Gurjar and then Maru Gurjar. Mm. So these three traditions, you know, which were there, which was actually chronologically coming down, mm. you know, also dealt with the regional idioms of architecture. Yes. And when the kind of confluence came together of different regions mm. and their influences, this very particular, you know, idiom developed. Mm -hmm. And that's why when we go to these step wells, we always feel that it is something like a temple. Yes. Because the parts were made that way. Mm -hmm. The decorations were made that way. And you can see Mata Bhavani, if you see that is the oldest, mm -hmm. it is from around 11th century. These were actually on the periphery of the old city, but they were very close to the city. Mm -hmm. So that's why they are sort of included now in the city of Ahmedabad. So, Mata Bhavani is from the beginning. It is worshipping water as goddess and that is unbroken tradition yes. from 11th century. Mm, so, that mm. is also a kind of example which connects the antiquity of the historic city to the 10th and 11th century period. There was something you said about patronage. There are some fascinating little vignettes that you told me about the patronage, for example, of uh, Bai Harir or Dada Harir. I don't know why it is known by these two names. Maybe you could talk about that a little bit. You see, this is the second or the third most important step well in Ahmedabad. This mm. is closer to Ahmedabad, you see, which is very close. Uh, on the northeastern side, I would say. And uh, the normal patronage came from wealthy people. Hmm. You see, queens or the nobility, you know, who actually invested in this kind of welfare measure, hmm. you know, for hmm. people. But this particular well was actually, you know, built out of the money that this lady saved throughout her life. She was actually the keeper of the harem of Mohammed Begala. I see. She served him throughout her life and 
you know, when she was very old, she gave away everything to build this kind of a chapel. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Including the mosque and the tomb. Including the mosque and the tomb where her grave is there. You know. mm. uh, in line of what we are discussing, since there was royal patronage, this was still community structures and not Connected exclusively the used no. by the royalty. No. Well, there are so many other wells also. So what was the tradition? I mean, can you have your personal well or you have to allow people to take water from your personal well also? Normally, you see... There were separate structures in the palaces. Okay. Now, you know, Ahmedabad Palace did not have a separate structure. The old palace, you know, which was around Bhadra. But it had a kind of water supply from the river itself. Mm. Because where there is this Ganesh Bari even today, there was a water wheel which lifted water from the river. Mm. And the upper part of the fort wall was the canals, which took the water to various areas of the fort. But in um, Rajasthan, there are step wells which are within palaces. That is for the use of the royalty as well as the immediate uh, kind of functionaries who work in the palace. But otherwise, water is something which is never ever, uh, you know, sort of exclusively, you know, sort of given to a particular community or caste. Mm -hmm. It is for all. And that was the tradition, you see. Mm -hmm. And the tanks which were built by the ruler were essentially community. That's right. You know, used at the, at the level of entire town or village. And this was also something very interesting because classical text also mentions which side of the settlement these kind of structure should be. Mm-hmm. And uh, there is a tradition that if you build a settlement, the soil which you excavate to make bricks and things like that actually is dug out. And becomes a lake. And that becomes the lake. Oh. And that used to be always southwest. Ah. So every village had a, a kind of a talao. And uh, in Queen Stepwell, I think the Sahastra Ling was also considered to be Absolutely. a kind yes. of feeder. Yes. yes. In Adalaj also, there is a kind of lake which is for the village. And that used to be the feeder for the well. And it would also reach out the aquifer. Yes, exactly. Yes. Now, you've just now mentioned Rani Nivao or Ranki Vau at Patan. And you've done a whole lot of work on that. Describe to us that place and what it is like. Because nobody knows about Sahastraling Talao also. Yeah. You know, if you sketch Sahastraling Talao, mm. the old Anhil War Patan mm. village, which is now the village, but it was a capital earlier. And if you really try to understand the entire topography mm. with Saraswati at mm. the back. Mm. The river. The river, which was actually feeding Sastraling as well as Rankiva. Mm. You know, you would really be able to understand how methodically they planned things, you know, which were part of the ecosystem of the area. Right. This is something, you know, which was very important. Wherever they built a step well for community, it was part of that ecosystem. Mm. Because I think it had to really function as a kind of surviving element. So the water had to come Uh somehow or other to that place. To that place and then that water has to really serve the purpose of the entire... So from Saraswati, the water comes into Sahastraling Talao and maybe recharges the aquifer of... Of the well. Of the well. And the well itself, it's huge, isn't it? It is huge. It is the biggest in India. And uh, I think uh, the depth is about more than 100 feet. It was full of water when we started measuring in 1989. And by the time we finished our measure drawings, which took almost 10 months, the well was dry. So this is something, you know, which we have seen that how these kind of wells completely went dry. And uh, this is a fantastic structure. And I could really imagine the excitement of building this. You know, we worked on the soil. Mm. We got the sides also dug to see. through ASI ah. to see. Mm. We tried to uh, find out the source of the stones. Mm. And we also documented through records, you know, the water level in that area. So all this we did. And then I studied the entire... Uh, process of well digging and then through that depth how they must have constructed the entire step corridor Ah, mm, which mm. is quite long it is more than 200 feet long yes yes so this is something you know which actually i sketched 
you know, in terms of how they must have even excavated these portions. Mm. 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 And we said that these excavations had to go alternate. Mm. So wherever, wherever there was a kind of angan, mm. you know, there was a cut which went through. Then the next angan, so mm. the step portions were left out oh. in excavation. I see. I see. So it went like that, you see, oh. that when... So that it doesn't collapse, No, perhaps. it doesn't collapse and entire excavation doesn't become a huge affair. Yes. Because once you started building pavilions, it actually started making things easier. Yes. To excavate the next. Right, right. And it also is excavated in step manner. Right. Mm. And this was known as a mathoda. Oh, the top of it. So it is easier to somehow control Always the excavation. In, in yes. terms of one human height. Human height. Yeah. Right. And in well also, that was the way the step thing went up, you know, right. in cylinder. Yes. So every time you sort of built, you know, there was a pause at the top of your height mm. uh -huh. so that you can build the next. Uh -huh, uh -huh. And it is at that point that the horizontal stone pads went into went the in. soil. Yes. And the, the string courses came. String the, courses came. The yes. carved ones. Yes. The carved, the carved ones. Yes. Yeah. All, all this is very, very fascinating and yes. very interesting. Uh, but disturbing is you mentioned about the water level receding in pattern. Now, if you can talk a little bit about the present state of some of these uh, vows and other structures and how do you see the future? The problem is that uh, this entire issue of bore well and harnessing water for agriculture from great depths, you see, yes. starved all these wells, you know, because the aquifers went so much down that the natural streams which are actually going into the wells completely dried out. Now, that is a process which is irreversible. You know, and the other thing is that you can't fill them. With water. With water. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Mm. So, all these questions about revival of step wells and, uh, you know, sort of rethinking about using them is, in my view, a far cry. Yes. You know, it can only stay now as some kind of historic memories, you know. Yeah, that yeah. this is a very serious problem, not only for step wells, step -wells. but for many other yes, kinds yes. of structures. Yeah, sure. Something should be done about them. Exactly. Okay? Because there is so much that, that has gone into doing this and making this. And I think that how it can be sort of maintained and uh, make people appreciate the value and all that has gone into it and the lessons that have been learned from yes. that. That sure. I think should be very important and we can talk about it some other time. Absolutely. I, I would like to thank both of you. Sure. Thank you very much. Thank, thank, you. You. thank you. Thank you. In our national program of talks tonight, you were listening to the panel discussion entitled Step into a Step Well. The panelists were Professor Ravindra Vasvara, renowned architect, historian and conservationist, Professor Neil Kant Chaya, former Dean of the Faculty of Architecture Center for Environmental Planning and Technology, Ahmedabad, and Sri Sohan Neil Kant, famous architect and Sarod player who initiated and moderated the discussion. Assistance in production was by Utkarsh Marathe and it was produced and presented by Ms. Rajni Ekka of AIR Ahmedabad and came to you from the Delhi station of All India Radio.